Good morning. Good morning, PCF Church family. Welcome, welcome. Um, if you're new here or visiting today, and we want to extend a special welcome to you, say thank you for joining us, and then invite you to stick around after the service so we can greet you and get to know you better. Uh, and if you're looking to get plugged in more here and join part of our community in a deeper way, there are a couple of opportunities to be aware of on the horizon. Uh, the first one is getting plugged into life groups, which will be starting back up soon now that the summer draws to an end. Um, there'll be more information on that to come. And then the second opportunity for women to be aware of is the new PCF Women's Ministry Small Groups, which will be changing format as they resume in the fall, um, but there'll be plenty of opportunities for ladies to get plugged in either during weekdays or on the weekends. Um, both of those things, you can find out more through coming announcements in future weeks or by subscribing to the PCF News emails that go out every week. If you're not signed up for those and you want to learn more, you can email the church office at info at pcfchurch.org and express your interest in joining the mailing list. Uh, this morning, there are a few other announcements to cover before we go to God's Word together. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, this afternoon's all-church baptism, which was scheduled for Peter and Mary Ann Schooneman's at 3, has been canceled because of the inclement weather. Um, instead, though, however, we are going to be baptizing the three people who were planned for this afternoon during the second service here, hence the, the trough. Um, so if you're interested in Sticking around, celebrating that, cheering on the people who will be baptized. Feel free to linger afterwards and hang around in the back and cheer them on. Um, we won't let some poor weather stop us from praising the work that God has done and giving new life. So we're thankful still to be able to do it, even though it's going to be raining. Uh, the next reminder is PCF Youth Group Ministry is not going to be meeting here at the church this coming Tuesday. Instead, we'll be meeting at the Meisner's home at 16 Chestnut Drive in Townsend for another pool party get-together. Um, boys, please bring snacks, and girls can bring drinks to share. Um, and as usual, the drop-off at 6 p.m. and pick up at 8.30 p.m. And then the following week on Tuesday, we'll be back here at the church again. Uh, next, children's ministry uh, for both participants and volunteers. Uh, this is just a friendly reminder that families are asked to register their kids online um, to help ministry leaders prepare for the new year of PCF Kids and Children's Church. That'll be starting up. If you're a volunteer, please also join us next Sunday afternoon. That'll be here at the church um, starting at 1230. There's going to be a celebration and training potluck that we'll be having here. Um, and together, we're going to strengthen our vision of children's ministry together review important safety policies, pray for the children and families that we're going to be serving in the coming year, and then unite together as a team. So if you'll be serving in any capacity, then please make every effort to join us. It'll be an important meeting. Uh, and then lastly, please save the date for the upcoming all-church gathering on September 13th at 7 p.m. We're going to be discussing several important budgetary matters, uh, leadership matters, and then new membership um, more information is going to be found in the PCF news email that I mentioned before, and it'll be announced over the coming weeks. As we transition now to a time of worship, let's all be still, clear our minds of any distractions or hindrances, allow God's word to work within us as we consider our maker, our redeemer, our closest friend, and the only Savior and lover of our souls who purchased us for himself. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 146, which reads, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, 
whose hope is the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed and who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Indeed, the Lord does reign forever. And for those of us who have been given the gift of spiritual eyes to see his kingship and his rule, we know that one day we will also reign with him in eternity that's hastening on towards us with each passing moment. Keeping our focus on the gift of faith that the Lord bestows on us, this morning's responsive reading comes from a collection of Puritan prayers called the Valley of Vision. I'll read the part of the leader, and you can respond as the congregation in green. My God, I bless you that you have given us eyes of faith to see you as Father, to know you as a covenant God, and to experience your love planted in us. For faith is the grace of union by which we claim you as our own. Faith casts our anchor upwards where we trust in you and engage you to be our Lord. Be pleased to live and move within us, to inhabit our praises, speak through our words, move through our actions, live through our lives, and grow us in your grace. Your abundant goodness has helped us believe, but our faith is often weak and wavers. Its light is dim. Its steps unsteady. Its increase is slow. Its backslidings are frequent. It should scale the heavens, but often lies groveling in the dust. Lord, fan this divine spark into a roaring flame. When faith sleeps, our hearts become an unclean thing, the fount of every abhorrent desire, the cage of unclean lusts all fluttering to escape, the noxious tree of deadly fruit, the open wayside of deceitful weeds. Lord, awaken faith to put forth its strength until all heaven fills our souls and all impurity is cast out. Amen. Having confessed our sin and need for Jesus together and our faith that we are his and he is ours, let us find our assurance in Peter's words that he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen.
pray together. Lord, we heard in our call to worship this morning that you are a God who sets the prisoners free and opens the eyes of the blind and lifts up those who are bowed down and watches over the sojourners and upholds the widow and the fatherless and that you are a God who brings the way of the wicked to ruin. This week we've seen the fall of the government in Afghanistan and the establishment of Taliban rule. We've heard stories of violence and of women being forced to marry. We've heard of Taliban threats against believers. We've been burdened as we've heard the concern and fear of our Afghan brothers and sisters who have asked us to pray that you will sustain them in believing your promises in the face of persecution. And Lord, we do pray earnestly that you will lift up those who are bowed down, that you will show yourself to be their God. We pray that you'll deliver them from evil men and bring the way the wicked to ruin. For the sake of your name, great God, protect and sustain our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout Afghanistan. Stymie the efforts of the Taliban to oppress the Afghan people, to harm and stifle and diminish women. We even pray boldly, Sovereign Lord, that you will convert members of the Taliban, that you show them the beauty of Jesus Christ and the wonder of salvation by grace and the glories of the gospel, that you'll win them to Christ and cause them to despise and flee their current ways of living. Lord, we know there are many in Pepperell and in this region who are prisoners to sin, whose eyes are are blinded spiritually, who are bowed down with the weight of expectations or self-imposed efforts to be good people. And we work and study and live alongside these dear folks. And we pray, Lord, for revival in this town and region. We pray that the gospel will bear fruit and grow, that eyes will be opened and lives will be changed. I want to give each one of us a moment to to allow the Spirit of God to bring to our minds one or two people in our lives who don't know Jesus, who don't know the freedom of the gospel, and then to stir silent prayer right now for their salvation. Let's just pause and pray for those the, the Lord brings to mind. When Paul and Barnabas spoke the gospel in the city of Antioch, the book of Acts tells us that the the Gentiles began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And Father, as we speak gospel words to those we've just prayed for, we ask that those who hear will rejoice and glorify the word of the Lord, and that as many as you have appointed to eternal life will believe. Father, please sovereignly grant the gift of faith to your elect, O Father God. Thank you for saving the three young ladies we're going to baptize later this morning, Emily and Felicity and Naomi, and we ask you, Lord, to bless their obedience to you in being baptized. We pray that they will live for you and walk with you all their days. And finally, Father, as both the Heinlein and Searle families move to North Carolina this week, we want to thank you for the amazing blessing that both of these families have been to us over the course of many years. We want to thank you for the close relationships they've built and for the ways they've used their gifts to build up our church family, for the ways they've pointed us to Jesus. We pray that you'll go before them to their new homes. Pray that you'll allow them to find and plug in quickly to great church families, that you'll provide everything they need and keep them walking very closely with you. We thank you, Lord, for the Heinleins and the Searles, and we want to send them on, our, on their way with our blessing and affection. We pray, Lord, as we come to your word, 
that you will stoke um, a passion for you, that you will fuel faith. Pray that we'll see things in the Word that we've never seen before and that we won't just have new ideas, but there will be uh, an affection for you, uh, an experience of you, a taste of you that will be transformative. We can't make these things happen on our own. We need your Holy Spirit to do them. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I add my welcome uh, to everyone who's here, great to have you worshiping with us. And we were going to, at this point in the service, dedicate Isaac Bachelor, but um, this week, again, he's still not feeling well. So you can pray for Isaac and for the Bachelor family as they uh, slog through illness, um, that God will, will help them yeah, in that. I uh, invite you to take out a Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. And if you need a Bible, just raise your hand in the air, hold it up long enough for one of the ushers to spot you and hand you on. By the way, we have some giveaway Bibles in the foyer. If you ever want to grab those on, the, on your way out the door, feel free to grab one and take it with you as our gift to you. I'm going to read uh, all 40 verses of Hebrews 11. So it's a longer passage this morning. It's a powerful one, one of the more famous chapters in all of Hebrews, maybe the most famous. So here's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and following. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. 
By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, and they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Last weekend, uh, I think I mentioned even last Sunday, our, our family spent Friday and Saturday with a great group of folks from Hampton Falls Baptist Church, and we were gathered at a Christian camp, a Sentinel Camp, Camp Sentinel, about uh, two hours north of here in New Hampshire, and I was speaking at uh, First Baptist Church of Hampton's uh, annual church retreat. And uh, the church very kindly gave our family the nicest cabin in the campground, the speaker's cabin, which was kind of down a hill a little bit. And then there was a turnoff and a long driveway. So it was sort of sitting off on its own down a- away from other, the other buildings. Uh, our family spent a good chunk of Friday evening with the church family, and we were playing games and having fun up at the lodge on the top of the hill. And at some point, Emma walked back down the hill to our cabin, and I waited up on the top of the hill with the kids until they finished the game they were playing. And then we, uh, the, the four, the, our three kids and I started walking back down toward the cabin. And by the time we were walking, it was pretty late. It was getting dark, actually almost pitch black. We were walking under trees, which made it even darker. And so I pulled out my phone and turned my flashlight on. And by that time, we were pretty well down this, this curvy dirt road. And then suddenly I noticed that my phone battery was at less than 10%. And uh, I began to get a little worried. Uh, we didn't have any other flashlights with us on this long dirt road. And I realized that if the four of us you know, were stranded there, my flashlight battery died and we didn't have any light. There was, no, there was just no other light. We couldn't look back up the hill and see where we'd come from. There was no way of seeing the cabin in front of us. We wouldn't know where the turnoff, the driveway was to get to that cabin and I just had no idea what we would do just maybe sit there on the road and wait for two hours until a car came along wasn't sure I, I I just started praying I didn't talk to the kids I just started praying fairly urgently that the Lord would sustain the battery in my phone and thankfully he did and we got to the cabin safely but I was thinking more about that experience this week and realizing that as we walked down that hill the people I care most about in the world were all invisible to me. I mean, I knew Emma was up there in the cabin ahead of us. I knew my three kids were walking 
you know, five feet behind me, but I just couldn't see him. It was just so totally pitch black. And, and I couldn't, I also I couldn't see a way of uniting us all. I couldn't see them. I couldn't see a way of getting us together. I was just totally reliant on that phone flashlight. It's really interesting when you think about the kind of world that God has created, and when you think about the kind of people, us, that he's created in order to set in that world. So God made us as embodied creatures, and we engage with the world largely through our senses. For many of us, sight is the most powerful, the most immediate, kind of visceral way that we link up to the world and connect to it. We see it. We interact with the world by seeing it. And yet we live in a world in which many of the most important realities are not seeable. Many of the most important things are invisible to us. So God and love and the virtues and the future, all those things, even though we are seeing creatures, we can't, we can't see those things. We can't see them with, with our eyes. And here's the issue with that. As embodied people who are used to seeing what we engage with, it's often extremely difficult for us to believe in or to be motivated by what we can't or don't see. You've heard the expression, I have to see it to believe it. And there's a reason that's a cliche. It's because it's so often true for many of us. God himself, I think, recognizes the power of sight and of the senses in our lives, which is why he often condescends to us to engage with us uh, through our senses. So I think of examples like the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper, very tangible, concrete elements which symbolize the the broken body and shed blood of Jesus, which was broken and shed 2,000 years ago. So we can't see it. We can't touch it because it's not here. It happened 2,000 years ago, but God condescends to us to give us these symbols so we can connect with those things. Or baptism. Baptism is this visual representation of an invisible spiritual reality, a transaction between God and people in which we die to our old way of life and we're raised to a new way of life and we, we can't see that happening, so God gives us baptism in order to depict it for us, because he knows that we engage with our world through sight. But nonetheless, in his wisdom, and this is what I've been considering this week and just kind of amazed by all over again, God has placed us in this world as seeing creatures in a world where many of the most important things, including himself, are invisible. And in some sense, all of us are walking around in the dark. We can't see God. We can't see the gospel. We can't see heaven. We can't see holiness or God's future for us. All those things are invisible to us with our physical eyes. But God has provided us a way that we can know those realities are true, even though we can't see them physically. And that way of spiritual seeing in the Bible is called faith. Faith is the main focus of the chapter I just read, Hebrews 11. And one way to tell what a central focus it is, is by noticing the number of times that the word faith shows up in this chapter. Maybe you noticed it as I read. Up until Hebrews chapter 11, the word faith is used a total of only six times in all of chapters 1 through 10. And then after chapter 11, in chapters 12 to 13, it's used only two times. But in Hebrews chapter 11, in these 40 verses, it shows up 24 times. So an average of every other verse, the word faith appears. It it is a central, it's the central theme of these these verses. There's a lot I can't say uh, about faith. uh, A lot I can't say about these verses in this sermon. We could easily take the next five Sundays and just walk slowly through Hebrews 11, savor it, unpack it. We're not going to do that. Instead, I want, to, I want to focus in the remainder of this sermon on four things about faith. So four things that faith is or faith does. And they're on the back of your bulletin. They'll be up here as well if you want to take some notes and follow along. Four things that faith does. Faith sees. Faith saves. Faith suffers. 
and faith spreads. It sees, saves, suffers, spreads. So let's dive right in. Faith sees. Look again at verse 1. It'll be really helpful to keep your Bible open and follow along for this sermon. Verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So you might say faith is the flashlight that you hold up over your head on that dark road. It's, it's like night vision goggles. It shows you all the things that are invisible, but that you can see through it, all those things that matter the most. You see these things through faith. And the author unpacks this a bit further in verse 3. He says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So here's one of the most basic questions we could ask. Where did everything come from? Where did it all come from? And none of us were there to see it at the moment of creation. And even if we had been there, we wouldn't have been able to see what the author talks about in verse 3, the word of God. You can't see words. Nor could we have seen... Uh, the, any, the, the nothingness out of which God created all things. The only way to know where the world came from, the author's saying, is by faith. That's what verse 3 says. Faith is the flashlight that, that illumines one of the most basic, important realities of the universe, its origin. Otherwise, it's invisible to us. Verse 1 says that faith is the conviction of things not seen. And when you think about it, there are several ways, there are at least a couple ways that something might be unseen. First, it might be invisible, not not seeable. So it might be an emotion or a virtue, something like anger or contentment or courage. You can't see any of those things. It might be unseen in that sense. Or second, it might be a visible thing that is not immediately present to you. Like what you're going to eat for lunch this afternoon. That's, that's not invisible, but it's not present. So it's unseen. You can't see it in the present moment. Actually, there are examples of both these kinds of unseen things in verses 6 and 7. So look down at those verses. In verse 6, the author says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who seek him. So faith believes that God exists even though God is invisible. God is spirit. He doesn't have a body to see. And actually, if you drop down to verse 27, you'll see what it says about Moses. Moses endured as seeing him, talking about God, as seeing him who is invisible. Faith sees the invisible. Faith sees God. Even though you can't see God with your physical eyes, you see him by faith. Look also at verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark. Now, when verse 7 speaks of unseen events, I think it's referring to the flood. And obviously, the flood was not an invisible event. It's not invisible like God. It was a very, I mean, it was an assault on the senses when the flood came there, there was a downpour, there were flood, there's flooding, the, the world was up to, upturned. You could see the flood when it came. But verse 7 says those events were as yet unseen. They were unseen, not because they were invisible, but because they were future. And the act of faith for Noah was believing God's word that the cataclysm was going to come, even though it hadn't come yet. That's faith. Faith is trusting God. Even though God's invisible, it's trusting God when he says something's going to happen or he's going to make good on a promise, even though the promise isn't fulfilled yet. Even though that thing he said is coming hasn't, hasn't happened yet. Same thing with Abraham in verse 10. For Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. That's talking about heaven. Heaven isn't visible to the naked eye. Heaven isn't here yet. Abraham wasn't experiencing it yet. But through faith, he was looking forward to it. In some sense, it was, he was seeing it. It was real to him. In verse 13, the author says, These all died in faith. He's talking about Old Testament saints. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them 
and greeted them from afar. So it's saying God's promises to the fathers were still future. They weren't present to see. But God allowed those Old Testament followers to look into the future and to see things that weren't yet present to see. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. It's a flashlight. It's night vision goggles. It sees. And that leads to another really important thing about faith that's highlighted in this chapter. Faith saves. Probably the most striking rhetorical feature of Hebrews 11 is the repetition of that phrase, by faith. I, know, I wonder if you noticed it as I read through the chapter. By faith, by faith, over and over again. In fact, it shows up 18 times. By faith, by faith. Abel did this, by faith. M- Moses did that, by faith, by faith, and on and on. And one of the, uh, the points the chapter is making is that faith works. I mean, it doesn't stay invisible. It, it enfleshes itself. It pushes out into deeds. Faith is an unbelievably powerful catalyst for action. In fact, all the remarkable things listed in this chapter were accomplished by faith. And I think the reason faith is so very powerful is that it connects us to all those unseen realities like God and His goodness and His character, and His provision, and His promises, all those unseen realities that wouldn't impact us or strengthen us otherwise. But when God opens our spiritual eyes, and we can see that He is there, we can know that His promises are true, and they're going to be real for us, that it, it opens up reality for us. And it gives us context, and it gives us hope, and it puts a ground under our feet so that we, we can act boldly. I mean, let me ask you, why are nightlights so powerful for kids? Why are they so popular with kids? Why do they diminish fear? Why does that mean a tiny little bulb plugged in the wall? Why does that diminish fear? And I think it's because they allow kids to see what's really in the room. It's not a, it's not a monster. It's the, it's a sweatshirt on the back of a chair. Like when, when you, when you actually see what's there, you have a context, you have an awareness of what's actually in the room, you are strengthened and emboldened. And that's what faith does. Faith sees. Faith shows you that God is right there beside you. And it shows you that His promises that that you haven't received yet are definitely coming to you. So you can rest on them and bank on them. That's why faith releases us into acts of obedience and bold and courageous action. No question that, that faith does that. But I think chapter 11 is saying more than that. Uh, Up until this week, actually for many years, I I have read chapter 11 as basically a list of amazing deeds that can be accomplished by faith. But as I studied the chapter this week, I, I I saw over and over again that the deeds that are mentioned throughout chapter 11 have to do with salvation, it's not just great, great deeds that we do for God. Uh, the things that are done by faith, just regularly throughout this chapter, have to do with salvation. So by faith, Abel offered God a sacrifice and was commended as righteous. And by faith, Enoch was taken up to be with God. And by faith, Noah constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Also by faith, Noah became an heir of the righteousness that is according to faith or that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham went to the promised land, the land of redemption. Over and over and over again throughout this chapter, faith is God's appointed means of saving his people, whether temporally, like Noah and his family from destruction by by the flood, or eternally as they move toward heaven and into God's presence. So verses 2 and 39 are bookends to this chapter. And both verses say it was by faith that, that, that Old Testament believers were commended by God. Verse 6 says it's by faith that we please God and draw near to Him. So faith saves. That's the message of this chapter. Faith saves both in this life and forever in the life to come. The reason faith saves 
is that it sees. In order to be saved, we, we must believe that there really is a God and that He really has made promises to us and He really will fulfill those promises. And without faith, we're just in the dark. We're, we're blundering around. We don't know that there is a God. We don't know that He's promised salvation. We, if He's promised it, we're not sure He's going to make good on it. Faith sees all these things and lays hold of them and therefore we're saved. But I think there's a real tension here in chapter 11. Uh, you, you could say, I think rightly, chapter 11 is profoundly optimistic because after all it says there's a way of salvation and it's through faith in God. But chapter 11 is also profoundly realistic. It's, it's optimistic and it's realistic. It takes into account that we live in a sinful world and we're not yet in heaven. So faith saves, yes, but the author, author also wants us to know that faith suffers. And here's why. Faith sees what is unseen, which means that the person who has faith sees things that others don't see. People of faith, people who live in light of unseen realities are therefore profoundly out of step with those who are spiritually blind. There's a story told in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings chapter 6, and maybe you know this one, where the king of Syria sends his horses and chariots and a great army to surround a city that the prophet Elisha is living in. And Elisha and his servant wake up one morning and see the Syrian army all around them, and Elisha's servant freaks out. He says, alas, my master, what shall we do? And meanwhile, Elisha is cool as a cucumber. He's just eating his breakfast cereal or whatever he eats for breakfast. And he doesn't seem phased at all. Perfectly relaxed. And at that point in the story, he asks God to open the eyes of his servant. And suddenly his servant can see that they are surrounded by horses and chariots of fire, by a heavenly army who are all on their side. He couldn't see it before, now he does. When you see spiritual realities by faith, you see differently, you live differently, and therefore you're out of step with those around you. The problem is, often this will be offensive to those who don't see what God has opened your eyes to see. In the last battle, final book of the Chronicles of Narnia, we, as a church family, you remember during COVID, we read through all seven of these together. So we, we read this book and this passage. And there's this kind of remarkable scene in which the children and the dwarves have entered the new creation. They've gone through this little shed and out into this world. And it's beautiful. And you can see into the distance. And it's, the further you go in there, the closer you're, you're going to get. Uh, the, the more beautiful things are going to become. And the problem is the dwarves are, are huddled just to the, the kind of entrance to this new world. They're in a little circle, and they're totally blind to what's around them. They still think they're in the old world, in, in that little dark shed. Uh, they're, I think even more striking, strikingly, they are blind to their blindness. It's not just that they don't see. It's that they don't understand that they don't see. They're not desperate about not seeing. In fact, they think the children who see this new world all around them They're the blind ones, or they're the foolish ones. And so the dwarves get angry at the kids, and they call them boneheads, and they yell at them. They're offended by by the kids and what they see. Verse 7 tells us that Noah constructed an ark because God had warned him of the coming flood. And I imagine that Noah got a lot of grief from his unbelieving neighbors as he constructed a massive ark on dry ground because they couldn't see what he saw. They couldn't see the future. They couldn't see the coming flood because they didn't have faith. Uh, Verse 19 says that Abraham believed so firmly in God's ability to raise the dead that when God commanded him to sacrifice his son Isaac, he obeyed until God called him to stop. And I'm pretty sure that an atheist observing Abraham would have been very offended by his actions because they couldn't have seen what Abraham saw, what Abraham believed. And let's make it a little more relevant for us. When we 
humbly and lovingly affirm the truth that there's just one way of salvation. Or that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Or that marriage, by God's design, is between one man and one woman. When we affirm these things on the basis of what God, the invisible God, has commanded us, has taught us about how life functions best, those around us who don't see or believe in that God or trust His promises, they're not going to appreciate what we say. They're going to be out, we're going to be out of step with them. We're going to be marching to the beat of a different drummer. And they may not think very highly of us at all. Uh, they may well be offended. We may suffer as a result. This emerges, I think, most powerfully at the end of chapter 11. Uh, the, the author has just told us of the triumphs of faith. So the, the conquering of kingdoms by faith and the enforcing of justice and the stopping of the mouths of lions and escapes from the edge of the sword. And then suddenly and very shockingly, in fact, they, the author just pivots right in the middle of verse 35. And he says, by faith, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. And by the way, that's, the, that's their faith. That's the act of faith. They saw the future resurrection even though they weren't there yet. And they were living in the present in light of that future. Others suffered mocking and flogging by faith and chains and imprisonment. By faith, some were stoned and some sawn in two. By faith, some were killed with the sword. And that's especially striking because notice if you look back up just three verses, verse 34 says that some escaped from the edge of the sword through faith. And verse 37 says that some were killed with the sword by faith. And we don't get to choose what the result is for us. We're just called to believe. Often in this world, faith suffers. But I want us to see one other feature of faith that is massively encouraging. And it's the fact that faith spreads. So I wonder if you've ever if you've ever thought about the question, why is chapter eleven part of the book of Hebrews? I mean, why does the author even include it? Why is it part of the book? Does he want to give his readers an entertaining interlude? He's done all this exposition and kind of hardcore warning and encouragement. And now he just wants to give us a break and tell us some stories. Or is he trying to satisfy biographical or historical curiosity? I think not at all. He is very aware of this important truth that faith spreads. It's infectious. So it's very good to teach about faith. But there is a unique power in showing faith. Showing faith in action. When we see faith in others, our faith grows. One of the women in our church told me recently that when she's struggling, she thinks of Kathy Crooker. Dear, beloved Kathy Crooker. Some of us never met Kathy Crooker. Others of us knew her really well and deeply for many years. Kathy passed away earlier this year. She led our women's ministry. And she was a woman of remarkable suffering and remarkable faith. She suffered a lot over many years. She experienced tremendous physical sufferings, including type 1 diabetes and many bypass surgeries and dialysis. And she had some toes amputated. And through all that, those of us who knew and loved Kathy will just testify, she trusted Jesus and exuded joy and confidence in God and in His promises. And this woman told me that she she used to go home from our women's ministry gatherings and tell her husband, Kathy was up there on stage bouncing around and she doesn't even have all her toes. Like, you know, how, how's that going to grow my faith to see her, her faith in the midst of suffering? Doesn't that, doesn't that happen to you when you're around other people who are confident in the promises of God and who are living for Him, especially when they're suffering and you see their faith is holding, it's not shaking, in fact, it's growing stronger? Doesn't that strengthen your own faith? I mean, the Apostle Paul talked a a lot about this. He said, I was in prison. He says in Philippians, I was in prison. And other people saw I was in prison. And they grew in their faith. And I always read that. I thought, that's exactly the opposite of what I would have thought. I would have thought, 
Paul's in prison. I'm, I'm more afraid, not less afraid. But Paul says, no, no, no. It's because my faith was still growing. I was receiving grace from God in prison. Other people saw, hey, you, you can be in prison and still receive God's grace. You, you can be in prison. Your faith is still growing. And so maybe prison wouldn't be the end of the world for me either. Maybe God would be faithful to me behind bars. And that, that's the way it works. Faith is infectious. Our faith grows when we see other people believing. And the author knows that. In fact, I think the key to understanding why he writes Hebrews 11 comes earlier in the book in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 to 12. You might want to just keep your finger in Hebrews 11 and just glance at those two verses. Hebrews 6, 11 to 12, because here's what the author says. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, Hebrews 6, 11 and 12, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's the key. Imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. In Hebrews 11, the author gives us all these examples of faith because he means for that faith to spread. He wants us to have faith, persevering faith, and therefore be saved. So remember the verse that comes just before chapter 11, the last verse of chapter 10, verse 39. 1039, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So the author writes, Hebrews 11, not simply because he wants us to see other people's faith, but because he wants to stoke our faith. He wants us to be imitators of those he depicts throughout chapter 11. 11, he wants us to preserve our souls. That's the purpose of the entire book of Hebrews. And therefore, Hebrews 11 functions integrally as part of that larger purpose of the whole book. If we want to grow in our faith, if we want to see the unseen, if we want to persevere in suffering and be saved by God at the last day, we ought regularly to place in front of us examples of those who have faith. We just ought to fill our lives with examples of faith in Christ. That's one of the reasons our family listens together to biographies of people like Amy Carmichael and Hudson Taylor and George Mueller. I mean, we have a ton of biographies in the library in the back of the sanctuary. Pull them off the shelf and read them or get the audio book and listen to it together with your family and stoke your faith. It's why all of us ought to read Christian biographies. That ought to be a staple of the way we spend our time so we can imitate the faith of those who have gone before us. I think it's why God places older men and older women in our church family who have run the race. They're ahead of us in the race, and they've run it well, and they've suffered, and their faith has held. And God has placed them here in our midst so that we can observe their lives and grow as their faith spreads to us. I mean, I think the older members of our congregation, they ought to have a backlog of people who have asked them out for coffee. They ought to be booked like six or seven weeks in advance because we ought to be just getting around them and saying, hey, can I spend time with you? Can I ask you questions? Can I observe you and just learn from the way you are living and trusting in Jesus? This is why God places us in Christian community with all of us, not just the older ones of us, but all of us, as we, we, we get to know each other and we observe the things that are difficult and we see, yes, God, you are powerful enough to sustain saving faith. It's why we ought not to allow other things on Sunday mornings to take precedence over our gathered worship. We, we ought to be dogged in gathering again and again and again so we can see each other and know each other and track with each other and observe God working in one another's lives. So may God grant that each one of us will have faith and preserve our souls. Not just a a momentary recognition that there is a God, but a sustaining, persevering, growing, fruit-bearing faith. And I want to ask, will you trust in Jesus? I mean, maybe, maybe you have in the past, And there's just another opportunity, whatever it is in your life right now, will will you trust in Jesus for that thing, the health need or 
the job change or the relational difficulty or, or whatever it is? Will you trust in Jesus for that? And maybe if you've never trusted in him, it might be that God has brought you here this morning to hear 40 verses on faith in order to get you over the edge. And maybe you've just been thinking about it and pondering and kind of researching. And it might be that God says this morning, uh, it's time. It's time to be like Abraham and Abel. And it's time to be like Moses. And, and, and it's time to trust in me and to see what is invisible. And if that's you, I would I just so love to pray with you after the service. Come up and talk to me or talk to another person you know, maybe who you came with. And, and, and I encourage you to trust in God, the invisible God, whose promises are real and who will save you as you trust in him. Father, uh, thank you for 40 verses on this thing that is the most relevant for us, the, 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 the trust that we can have in you, that you exist and that you reward those who diligently seek you, that your promises are true and real. Uh, I pray that you will open our eyes as we trust in you to see what we can't see in any other way. Lord, uh, stoke our, our faith, fuel our faith. And if there's anyone here who has never trusted before in you, who, who hasn't, is just kind of uh, standing back and assessing and evaluating, uh, give the, grant the gift of faith, Lord. Uh, so that we can see, open our eyes to see you in your beauty and uh, cause this response of faith within us. And we pray these things with great joy. Lord, um, we, we thank you that you've not left us alone in a dark world. We are, we are grateful people. We are a blessed people. Um, the, the fact that, that you would show us yourself, the fact that you would give promises to us and then work this thing in our hearts so that we believe those promises. I mean, that's a miracle, Lord. And it's, it's our hope and it's our portion. It's our joy. So these are serious things, but they're very joyful things. They're happy things. It's gospel we've been talking about. And so I pray as we sing that our hearts will overflow into music and you'll cause us to, to love you more as we sing this praise to you in Jesus' name, amen. There is no one like our God. He is great, and his name is full of power. Please rise and worship him this morning. Give me eyes to see more of who you are. Take what I have known and break it all apart. For you, my God, the greatest still. And no sky contains, no doubt restrains all you are. The greatness of our my life to know and I'm far from close to all you are the greatness of our Grace, give me grace to see beyond this moment here. To believe that there is nothing left. 
to fear and that you alone are high above it all for you my God a greater still and no sky contains no doubt restraints all you are the greatness of our God I spend my life to know and I'm far from close to all you are the greatness of our God no sky contains and no sky contains no doubt restraints all you are greatness of our God. I spend my life to know I'm far from close to all you are. The greatness of our separate us from your love no life no death of this I am convinced that you my God a greater still there's nothing and there is nothing that could ever separate us and there is nothing that could ever separate us from your love. No life, no death. Of this I am convinced that you, my God, are greater still. And no words could say or song convey all you greatness of our God. I spend my life to know that I'm far from close to all you are. The greatness of our God. And no sky contains, no doubt restrains all you are. The greatness of our God. of our God and all you are the greatness of our Space on bended knee shall come. Though kingdoms pass away, your majesty remains. How great you are! How great must be your song. The Alpha. Stand in awe, this 
Father God, source of all good, what could we possibly bring to you? Your own dear Son, begotten and not created, our Redeemer, our proxy, our substitute, his self-emptying incomprehensible. 
his infinity of love beyond the mind's grasp. This is wonder of wonders, that he came below to raise us above, that he was born like us, that we might become like him. This is love. When we cannot rise to him, he draws near on wings of grace to raise himself. This is power. When deity and humanity were infinitely separated, he united them in an insoluble unity, the uncreated and the created. This is wisdom. When we were undone with no will to return to him, and no intellect to devise recovery, he came, God incarnate, to save us to the uttermost, as man to die our death, to shed satisfying blood on our behalf, to work out a perfect, perfect righteousness for us. O oh God, enlarge our minds. Let us hear good tidings of great joy and hearing, believe, rejoice, praise, adore, to look upon them, upon our Redeemer's face, and in him account ourselves delivered from sin, embrace him with undying faith, exulting that he is ours and we are his. In him you have given us so much that heaven can give no more. Amen. mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Descended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Be the perfect Son of Man in His living. Suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man. Christ, the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in Him we stand. the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold. Bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death, 
And for uh, worshiping with us this morning, you can continue your worship by giving tithes and offerings, if you like, in the two boxes by the back door as you leave. 
No worship wiggles today on account of the rain. Uh, but if you would like to stick around for the second service, we're going to be baptizing three folks. Um, so you're very welcome to st- stick around, chat with each other on the deck, and then uh, be, be part of that baptism service in the second service. Uh, receive the benediction now. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all evermore. Amen.